I want to welcome you all here to our Minority Concerns program, which is entitled The Life and Impact of John S. Rock. And I want to thank you very, very much for joining us here for this important program. Can you imagine a better place to have an event such as this in this gorgeous, restored, historic courthouse facility. It is, as many of you know, the oldest continuing uh, use courtroom in the state of New Jersey and the second oldest in the United States. About 150 people gathered at the old Salem courthouse to learn about John Stewart Rock, a native son of Salem County. Rock was born to free parents in Elsinboro Township in 1825. He went on to become an educator, dentist, physician, and ultimately a lawyer. As a doctor in Boston, he treated sick fugitive slaves and was one of the leading black abolitionists in New England. He was a prolific orator and is credited with coining the phrase, black is beautiful. The first question that's always asked of me is, how, how did I find out about John Rock? And I'll, real quick, how many of you knew of John Rock before today? That's not good. <laughs> Dr. J. Harlan Busby is an area historian. It was on February 1st, 1865, however, that Rock received the highest recognition of his career. On that day, following a motion by Senator Sumner, Rock became the first black man in history to be admitted to practice law before the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. This was the highlight of his legal career and an unprecedented event sending chronicle reverberations throughout the national and international presses. The next day in Washington, the House of Representatives received him, and Rock was the first black lawyer to be introduced at a session of Congress. It would be the last triumph act of his triumphant act of his life overflowing with achievement. Dr. Christopher Brooks, an associate professor of history at East Stroudsburg University, explored Rock's legal career. He recounted how Rock and U.S. Senator Charles Sumner, also an abolitionist, exchanged 12 letters leading up to Rock's admittance to argue before the United States Supreme Court. Sumner expressed in those letters it was difficult, in light of the 1857 Dred Scott decision that affirmed slave owners' rights to take slaves to the new Western territories. Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote the majority opinion. Taney being an impediment to Rock's admittance to the U.S. Supreme Court bar at the time certainly frustrated Rock. According to Benjamin Quarles, the author, Rock wrote of Justice Taney to a friend that, I quote, the old man lives out of spite, end quote, and would logically never allow a man of African heritage to argue before the high court. Death is never something one should celebrate, at least that's my opinion. But the death of Justice Taney of Maryland in October 1864 opened the door to Rock being admitted. Making this admittance more likely was Taney's successor, Sam M. Portland Chase of New Hampshire. Chase was a champion of the abolitionist cause, thus Rock's desire to be admitted, well, the barrier had more or less been lifted. Rock died of tuberculosis at age 41 without ever trying a case. The audience was also treated to a panel discussion, which included retired New Jersey Supreme Court Justice John Wallace, Superior Court Judge Christine Allen Jackson, Cumberland County Prosecutor Jennifer Webb McCray, Municipal Prosecutor Demetrica Todd Ruiz, and Attorney Chad Davis. They spoke of their personal experiences with diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. I have always felt in my life that from the things that you do, you start, you build confidence. And uh, uh, no matter what happens, uh, there, there are going to be roadblocks, but if you have the confidence to overcome them and you, you work hard at it, you generally do overcome uh, those roadblocks. It was a challenge after then because then I said, now wait a minute, I'm not going to let this get the best of me. I'm not going to let this uh, make me an example of, oh, see, she fainted, she can't handle it. So I never really wanted to let them see me sweat. I had to take a chance and rely on myself and believe that if I did this and I worked hard, I was going to be able to support myself and my son because I never wanted to be in that situation where I could not do that. And every single time I've had a, a challenge, I draw back to that like initial experience 
of kind of being afraid with a little baby and being able to, to go out and, and do what I needed to do to support him. And it kind of gives me confidence in those challenges that I can, I can do it. When people see you, they don't assume you're an attorney. Um, so at my law practice, generally a client might come in and they say, I'm sorry, what do you do here? Ms. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew can attest to that too. She's also at her office. Uh, and, and so what do you have to do to overcome it? You have to be extra sharp. I mean, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, you really have to uh, come across professionally to every client um, to let them know that you know what you're talking about. But with the age of technology and, and social media, you can send a text. Um, it doesn't always have to be the face-to-face, -face. so consider that when, when you contemplate, like, if you have the time, like, because you do if you can just sit there and send a text. And I am so grateful for the woman friend that's sitting to my right that is a true mentor to me. Um, Judge Allen Jackson, uh, uh, Jennifer is, is the one that fell in potholes, so I didn't have to. And she, <laughs> she, is, now, a lot and of she, them. And she is now telling me, like, you know, that's a pothole, so go to the left. <laughs> or go to the right. So, so thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, I can recall uh, both uh, my parents were, were mentors directly. Uh, Indirectly, there were many judges that I interacted with who uh, would give you suggestions, would talk to you about issues, and not necessarily a, a case that you were dealing with, but uh, things that would help you in, in your daily life. Uh, I have tried to uh, uh, turn that around and, and help others. I do a great deal of, uh, of coaching. I mean, we have struggles, but when you hear about somebody like uh, John Rock who was admitted to the bar, but it took 50 more years for an African American to actually argue a case before the bar. Um, you know that we have it very easy in comparison to them. Thousands. So, but yet you still call yourself slaves and Africans. That I I I think that's a cold piece to tell your children they're slaves. I I remember. Can you remember when you came into school and heard the slave thing? Do you remember that or you don't? Yeah, I remember. I remember when, it, well, they bought it. I was I think I was in the seventh grade. What? You had you had that long to, to, to wait before you heard about slaves? Yeah. Seven, man, I it, was it, a baby. I was like probably first grade or I feel like it was kindergarten, but I guess it was first grade, but it was really early. And I was, you know, the only one in the class, right? Well, you were on the East Coast. Oh, my God. The feeling I had, I just was like. And so then, I, you know, we did have a Black history thing. Or I don't even know if it was Black history. It might not even have been Black history. I don't think it was that. I think I just was like, I was searching for, some, for something, something that was positive. I remember right. my first three book reports. I think my first book report, I think my first one was um, Phyllis Wheatley. And then I did George Washington Carver. I think the last one I did was Frederick Douglass. But I was like fixated on Dagon trying to, you know, find positive things in history because of that whole slave story that was beaten into me in first grade. It was horrible. Yeah, man, it didn't get it didn't get to me until the uh, seventh grade. Oh, yeah, yeah. With, with that with that roots story. Oh, yeah, I got it way before roots. That's why yeah. before roots. That's why I read roots. I read roots I, like I was in what seventh grade, I guess. You know, I read roots, and before it came out, and I, I because I was you know I had already started being like I was starving. Like I said, from first grade on. I was starving for some affirmation that, you know, I was okay. Right. <laughs> you know, really, this is terrible. But they historically mess you up with these, these characters that they put before us, you know, and even though they, they, they want to drag out, you know, Tubman, like that's some, oh, you had to be under the ground. Um, somebody had to, somebody with seizure problems had to dag on protect you to take you to say, I mean, come on now. I just, is this, oh my gosh. And where's our imagination in all of this? You know, I, I think that's one of the things that the stories do kills your imagination. 
Yeah. Did you ever hear? Have you heard of uh, Dr. Rock? Dr. Who? Rock. No. Okay. So when I was in New Jersey, I was looking as a kid. Like I said, I was on a mad search for like affirmation of, you know, am I, can I be okay? You know, because I was. I mean, man, the slave stuff, being the only one in class, you know, it was a, it was a thing. Yeah, it was, it was rough. I felt, I felt like it was rough. And so I, you know, I was looking for something. So um, ended up, you know, getting in, you know, going to the library, looking at, you know, uh, you know, these different books and trying to, you know, find out stuff. And I found, I discovered this doc, this Dr. Rock. I discovered him and then I could never find anything else about him. I looked and looked and, and all the, my life, I have not found, I just found him again. Somebody did an article about him somewhere on the internet. I think that's how I ended up running into him again. They had a list of people. Uh, anyway, um, I found him just yesterday, right? And I was like, Dr. Rock! Because I was like, where is that daggone man? Because he was, I thought he was amazing. So this is Dr. Rock. Let me see if I got him. Uh, am I sharing him? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So doctor, and I did, and I never had an image of him. So this is my first time seeing him. I only read about him, and I was kind of had a crush just reading about him because he was so impressive. But it, you know, he's he's kind of cool looking cat. Anyway, Doctor Rock uh, is a brother who was, and actually, they don't say he was born a slave. He was. They don't say that about him. He was he was free in eighteen early eighteen hundreds, eighteen twelve or something like that in um, New Jersey, and this brother was like teaching school and going and part time. He was with two white doctors learning try to try to be an apprentice to be a, a medical doctor, right? And so he apprenticed with them and was ready to get some final like boarding training, whatever you know, certified. They wouldn't allow him, right? So they wouldn't allow him in medical, you know, get that final training to become a medical doctor. So he went on and became a dentist, right? So then <clears throat> they allowed him. It opened up, after he became a dentist. They allowed him. They opened him up. Opened up for him to be. And this is all. This is all like in the 1800s, right? Remind you, right? Before emancipation. So then they went ahead and um, allowed him to be a doctor. So he became a medical doctor. So he's a dentist and a doctor, right? So then something happened. I guess he felt, I don't know what, maybe some injustice or whatever. So then the brother goes to medical, goes to law school. He ends up being like the one of the first board certified in Massachusetts, some Supreme Court, first one to be some, some uh, Supreme Court uh, to speak, you know, to, 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 you know, whatever adjudicate or whatever he did in the supreme court this man was a doctor a lawyer and a dentist and he was also an advocate for whatever some kind of emancipation well i don't, I don't know if i believe in all that they going uh you know whatever but anyway he was also a lecturer or whatever this man was a doctor a lawyer and a dentist before the so-called emancipation Okay, so I mean, doc, uh, yeah, and his his name is uh, John S. Rock. Come on, y'all. I mean, we have loads of inspiration, yet we we given what are we handed? Harriet Tubman, the woman with the bashed in face or whatever, with the seizures and you know the gimp leg. I don't know what else she had going on. And she and she didn't even go deep in the south to help nobody. How how far how far in the south did she get? She only went to Maryland and helped her own people. She might have went to Virginia, but she went no really, from my knowledge, she only helped her own family. Is Maryland is Maryland considered the South? Well, the Mason-Dixon line is uh, above Maryland, so I guess it is. It's considered partially the South, but not really. That's why 
part of her family were already free. So it didn't make any sense. Right. Her daddy was free. Her husband was free. You know, it was... You know what okay, I mean? So, okay, so I, okay, so I have a question why we're here now. Right. And maybe the audience can help us come with this. I think for since next next week, next month is Black History Month, indigenous indigenous year, or however we come up with it, gotta follow soon to blast that black history stuff out because it's been nothing but a thorn. It no, it's, not a thorn. it's not a thorn because it's not black history, it's indigenous history. It's not a thorn at all. It's it's a mis it's a mislabeling, is what it is. What you I better not corrected. do what you better not do is let them call it African American. <laughs> <laughs> that you better not let them do. But as long as it's black history, okay, that's cool. That's just a mislabeling. That's a minor, that's a minor mislabeling. They start calling it African American. That's a major mislabeling. But it's it's all you know, it's all our history. It's indigenous people's history, right? So, you know, hey, it's I'm good with it. You know, it's indigenous people month next month. Does he look like does he look like an African? Nothing like an African. Shaw Q says he kind of looks like Randy Moss. Yeah, okay. Who's that? I don't know who that is. Uh, Sean, brother, that's in the chat. He said Indigenous American Indian History Month. That's right. Yeah. That's what no. it is. Call it what it is and, and rename it. See, we have that power. They don't tell us. We tell them. Every time. And then every time you see somebody say Black History, you say, oh, no, it's Indigenous History Month. Indigenous History a right. American Indian History Month. Happy American. And every time everybody says uh, something about it, you you change the name. And that's how you get stuff done. You don't sit silently and be like, this is some bullshit. No, you say, I'm changing the damn name. Right. And, when, and why are you calling it that? Black is not, black is nothing. Black is dead. It's American Indigenous History Month, fool. <laughs> And you and they'll, and they'll start saying it then. Huh? They'll start saying it then. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, but that's that's how it works though. You have to if you it ain't gonna be nothing unless we make it something. Right. Right. It ain't gonna be nothing unless we make it something. We gotta start the party ourselves. They ain't gonna start the party for us. And then they're gonna want to try to come to your party. Oh yes, oh yeah, of course. Because why wouldn't they? Right. Why wouldn't they? Well, cool, yeah, Lisa. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And what's the guy's name again? John Rock. John S. Rock. Don't forget that name. John S. Rock. Hey, have That's your like, day. You know, we got we got super people. We got people that wore capes. They was doing super stuff. And just think about it. The, what we don't know. There's so many people that we don't know. Because they put up who they want us to know. People that ain't going to get us like riveted. Like this man, he gets you riveted. You're like, what? He did all that? Make me tired. Like what? 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 He was busy putting in work. It's like when you're discouraged, you're like, you know, I don't really feel like doing that. I was thinking about doing that, but you know, I don't know. Nah, he did everything. Whatever he wanted to do, he did it. And, and at a time when we're supposed to not even be able to read, so they tell us. Right, right. Right? We just got to, they was important damn Africans, and he was getting his dad going low degree. <laughs> make it make sense. When was the Clotilda? Wait a minute. Let's get this. <laughs> wait, no. wait a minute. The Clotilda was happening when he was getting his. Let's let's y'all. You know, that's what you got to do. You got to put things in perspective, y'all. When was the Clotilda? That was in autumn, eighteen fifty nine. This brother was getting his damn 
Was he getting his medical degree or did he have all of it? They probably had all of it done. You know what I'm saying? They was importing slaves, they tell you. That's what they tell you. <laughs> That's what they tell you. That's what you're supposed to believe. But but Dr. Rock, Dr. Rock, he was getting his, his he was starting on his third profession. Okay. <laughs> So just imagine if your if your kid if your child did him for a book report at school or I don't I don't know how they do it now, but right. your children presented this this brother in their class, right? They got the A for the year. Well, they should. They should. It should enlighten the teacher. Yeah. And it should inspire them. But yet you got there going skip gates. Trying to tell you that the I don't know the football player whoever he was talking to, his people came off the Clotilda, and the <laughs> why why would you believe they was bringing some damn Africans in when you got a brother walking around? They're gonna get in his they're gonna third profession on. Have, have you got you another seen... brother. You got another brother owning sixty eight slaves in South Carolina at the same time. Okay, you know what I mean. Put things in perspective. When was Edward, what's the guy? Is it Edmonds or Ellison? Ellison was in South Carolina. He supposedly was one of the richest landowners and he had 68 slaves. Line it up. You got Dr. Rock getting his third profession on, becoming a lawyer, doctor, and a daggone dentist. Then you got the Clotilda supposedly arriving with slaves. <laughs> then you got the slave owner. The slave owner who's a Negro and who's an Indian in South Carolina with 68 slaves and, the, and they're the only ones. But, the, but he's supposed to be from Africa too. And then you got all, okay, and then the, the, this is the thing I want you all to talk to you when you're trying to make sense of this and you're talking to your dead girl people that are in opposition. Keep this in your, in your back pocket. If all these Africans since the 1600s came here and all these Africans were set free, why didn't they go back? Why didn't they come get their folk? Why didn't they bring folks in? Story don't add up. Uh -uh. Story don't add up. And so you see how we believe these stories and we don't let them go. We carry them through our whole, we die with them. Oh, yeah. So, Lisa. Yes. Thank you for this evening. Thank see, you. So, you see, when, so when I go to bed, I have a clear head. I can think of cool stuff every time I do a program with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Dr. R Dr. John, John S. Rock because and he's probably related to Chris Rock. <laughs> okay? Right. Okay. And he looks like the guy Turtle Gang. He actually looks like Turtle Gang. This, we can see the relationship yeah. with people. Yeah. His name is Rock. Chris Rock is from New Jersey. This is a Dr. Rock. You think there's no connection? Come on, y'all. But yet we think the Clotilda was rolling in with some fresh Africans. <laughs> Coming through Alabama. Coming through of all places. Of all places, Alabama. Come on now. You know why they were coming through Alabama? Because they were trying to do, there was secession. They were trying, they wanted them Negroes to think, oh yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we got African. It was a whole propaganda thing to scare, scare the dead gone Negroes. It was propaganda, like everything else they do. It's a fake story. We gonna keep going with the propaganda, y'all, or we gonna start thinking for ourselves? Negroes need to think they're from Africa, even if we got to make up that a ship came in. And, and tell them who they're related to. And tell them that they're related to the people that came off that Clotilda. They probably laughed their asses off when they thought of that damn name. 
We'll call the ship Clotel and them niggas ain't gonna know the difference. <laughs> and then when we ask, if they, what if they ask where the ship, where, where, the, where the ship is? Oh, we're gonna tell them we burnt that thing <laughs> up. Right, you, right. You gonna build a whole ship and burn it? That wasn't real, was it?